G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another video uh, on the other side of that big Euro trip that I've done. In today's video, what I'm gonna do is go back through the last uh, number of weeks where I wasn't watching much footy, and I've done a bit of research and picked up on a few things that uh, I guess we learned during that period, or certainly that I've learned reflecting on the three weeks that went past. A fair bit's happened, I guess. Some individuals have really bobbed up and uh, made a name for themselves. On top of that, teams have really come out of the woodwork and really established themselves either as a contender or have potentially ruined their season in the last number of weeks as well. So the format of this video will kind of be like a eight or nine things that I've learned over these few weeks, and I'm just gonna pick out a few points that I think are worth discussing. As you may know from my previous videos, I am back from the trip. Uh, everything is going back to normal in terms of the programming of this YouTube channel, the consistency, the format, it's all back to normal now. I've done my footy tips for this week. I uh, added them very, very late in the piece. I've done a video talking about my Kentucky trip and now that's done. Later on this weekend or early next week, you'll also see probably an Eagles Corner video um, following our game against Sydney. Regardless of how that goes, I'll just do a bit of a, a catch up on how the Eagles are going. And then of course, I intend to do a round review uh, as of Monday as well with Druzy currently not able to upload videos for the channel. But without further ado, let's get into a little bit of a reflection over the last three or four weeks in the AFL. So these are in no particular order and I'll start off with I guess one thing that we've sort of learned or had reaffirmed was the fact that the Adelaide Crows probably do have the best forward line potency of any team in the competition that, uh, this year. You're probably wondering how I learned that. Well, I support the West Coast Eagles uh, and we were on the receiving end of the biggest win uh, and, and certainly the highest score of any team this season with them scoring 174 points against us. To be honest, uh, it's not about that game in isolation. I think uh, I said in a previous video, the recipe for a massacre in that game was always there. The Eagles suck. They had about four or five first choice defenders unavailable for that game and, and Rhett Bazo, uh, the 19 year old, was the only key defender available. But on the other side of the coin, you know, the Crows have a, a good contested style midfield that run and spread really well, which allowed them to get the ball inside 50 plenty of times. And not just in terms of quantity, but the quality of their inside 50s was very good too. And I think overall, we just have to accept that Adelaide probably have the most dangerous forward line in the competition right now. Obviously, Tex Walker kicked 10 goals in the game that I mentioned. He's up to 38 goals for the season. I think that's like fourth or fifth in the Coleman as I currently record this. But you also look towards, you know, some of the smaller types, Isaac Rankin and Josh Rochelle. Rankin's kicked 24, 16 to Rochelle. So that's 40 goals between them as small forwards. That's a really, really elite combo. And some other young guns have hit the scoreboard really consistently this year as well. Darcy Fogarty's had 21 goals for the year. He's coming along really, really nicely as a sort of uh, undersized key forward almost to like a third tall. And Luke Pedler as well um, is starting to make a name for himself as a forward as well. He's kicked 16 goals this year. And if I'm not mistaken, he was drafted as a midfielder. So that's a key takeaway about the Crows, I guess, is their forward half potency. And it, uh, that kind of reminds me both of Adelaide back when, you know, they were competing for in the grand final in 2017. They had probably the best forward line in the comp. It kind of reminds me of like the 2014 Eagles as well, where for us, you know, we had the ability to really smash teams. And we've seen Adelaide do that on their home deck this year with big wins over St. Kilda and uh, Carlton earlier in the year. If that team is winning the midfield battle and getting supply, the forward line is good enough to really, really put teams to the sword. And we're seeing that with Adelaide. The next uh, development over the last few weeks that I've noticed as well is probably the ascension of Tim Taranto from being, you know, a, a, just a good midfielder in terms of this year's form to probably being a genuine Brownlow medal favourite. In his last five games in particular, he's really taken his game to the next level. In the last five weeks, he's averaged 35 possessions a game, seven clearances and seven tackles. The most prolific performance he's had this year was against St Kilda recently in that 20-point win where he had 38 touches, a goal and 10 tackles. So he's hitting the scoreboard. He's playing well inside. He's winning his own ball. He's defensively minded as well. Now that we're seeing this weird little purple patch here from Richmond, I shouldn't say weird, but it was a little bit unexpected. You know, their form has been weird in a sense this year. It's been terrible at times and really good at other times. But my point being is if they keep banking wins under McWalter as coach at the moment, it gives Taranto a chance to notch some of these two to three vote uh, performances. Naturally, of course, if a team's losing, he's less likely to get three votes in any given game. As a side note, one thing I've noticed about Richmond as well, there was a long period under hard week there where they'd lost something like 12 close games in a row, but they've won three recently under McWalter as well. So perhaps we're seeing a little bit of a turn of the tide and Richmond might start banking some wins for Taranto's Brownlow chances. The third observation, I guess, would be the fact that things are really seeming to start to click for GWS under coach Adam Kingsley. Obviously, it's a new coach and it would take a little while for the team to sort of start to play his way, but I think we're starting to see some real green shoots 
over the last four weeks or so. In fact, they've won three of the last four and bizarrely are still like somewhat a chance for finals. In their last five, they had that 70-point win over Fremantle, which is a big result considering Fremantle were in decent form up until recently. They beat North by five goals and they, uh, perhaps most impressively of all, uh, beat Geelong at GMHBA Stadium, which is one of the hardest trips in AFL footy. Their two losses in that time were a six-point loss to Richmond, who are playing some reasonable footy right now, and a 12-point loss to the Saints, who are fifth. Their forward half pressure seems to be a real feature of their game. I think they scored like eight goals from forward half turnovers against Fremantle. In the last three games, they're averaging 67 inside 50s and have hit 100 plus points in all three of those games. Interestingly, they are fifth in the competition for inside 50, which is impressive when you consider the four teams ahead of them are Melbourne, Port Adelaide, the Pies and the Lions, which are pretty much concrete, the best four teams in the comp right now. So the Giants are getting the ball inside 50. They just need to rely on that forward line to convert those opportunities. The next one is Port Adelaide really cementing themselves as a series contender. I think we have to suggest that at this time of the year. It's their longest ever winning streak as a club. They've won 10 in a row. And interestingly, they've won their last nine games at Marvel Stadium. But Port's a funny one in terms of, you know, breaking down their stats. I think they're ranked 17th in the league for disposals on average. It's the second least disposals per game of any team, yet they sit currently top of the ladder. Uh, They're last in the league for marks, but they're also second in the league for inside 50. So what we're seeing is low possession, but really high impact play from Port Adelaide. In the last five weeks, they beat the Demons by four points. They beat the Cats by something like five goals. They've also had a win at the MCG, admittedly against Richmond, who have been up and down this year. But they're ticking a lot of boxes, Port Adelaide, and I think we have to consider them a genuine premiership contender. We've talked about it a lot this season. It's been an explosion of a lot of young guns in their prime that we've been waiting to take the next step. In particular, Zach Butters is the best example of that. We know Connor Rosie has ascended to be an elite player now. And even like role players like Burn Jones and, and Pal Pepper is a high half forward. Jeremy Finlayson's also hitting the scoreboard uh, about as much as I can ever remember in his career. So we're starting to see a lot of different players click at the same time for Port Adelaide, and this might be their year. The fifth observation is that St Kilda are starting to slip, and it remains to be seen whether that's uh, you know mirroring last year where they went eight and three midway through the year and then fell away to miss finals. I think they finished with something like 10th. Or it could just be a mid-season slump because sometimes teams who start the year well go through a slump at some point in the season. So it does remain to be seen, but we do know they won five of their first six. They were top of the ladder uh, at after round six this year. They were third as recently as round eight. But since then, they've lost four of their last six with losses against Richmond and Hawthorne, the most concerning on paper, even though they're two average teams that seem to be playing um, you know, not out of their skins, but certainly playing much improved football lately. Last night, they had a tough loss against the Brisbane Lions. They're a quality side, uh, and they did have that big loss against the Crows in Adelaide, where they looked like their defensive game was sort of picked apart. Either way, there's a big gulf in where St Kilda were, you know, in the first couple of months of the season to where they are now. But it does look a little bit concerning considering, you know, previous year's form where they have a knack of dropping off later in seasons. But on the plus side, I think for the first time in a while, we're seeing some real young guns have some green shoots at St Kilda. They've got some really quality youth. Machido Owens, I've talked about, should probably be the second favourite for a rising star. Wanganine Miller is also having a really underrated year off halfback. And then, uh, of course, Mateus Philippou, I'm a big fan of as well. So it remains to be seen whether they can stabilize and make finals but either way I think the future the short to medium term future for Secuta is looking decent regardless so those are five observations I've made about teams I want to talk a little bit about some individuals now and the one I'll start with is Nick Larkey who I think is actually having a really underrated season and I say underrated because I haven't really been exposed to media headlines over the last three weeks Uh, but when you consider what this guy's achieved in a team that is second last and somehow still a contender for the wooden spoon, although I don't really think that's a realistic chance. But he is equal second in the common with 39 goals. He's level with Jeremy Cameron, and uh, I think he's played one less game. So that's an outrageous effort. He kicked five against Collingwood and four against Port Adelaide. So he's doing it against genuine contenders. And he's also done, uh, you know, he kicked six on West Coast. He kicked four on Fremantle. So for the most part, it's been a consistent season. He had a pretty quiet patch. I think he kicked two goals across three games between rounds four and six. But since round six, He's actually been very, very consistent. He's 25 years old. He's just entering his prime. Just imagine how good 
good he could be in a side that wasn't second last. I'll talk about another North Melbourne individual here and over the last month or so I think we've seen you know George Wardlaw debut and show that he has signs of being a serious jet one day. He was an outside contender for pick one in last year's draft. There were some concerns over hamstrings which I hope is behind him because what we're seeing now is a player that could justifiably have been pick one last year. He's a smaller size inside mid but he is explosive and aggressive as all hell in every sense of the word in terms of his attack on the ball but also the way he distributes the footy as well. He's kind of a one-touch player. I mean he does fumble a little bit because he's you know he's played five games of AFL football but he's a very composed player and one thing I've noticed as well he has a knack for waiting for the best option not necessarily just giving it off at first instance like a lot of 18 year olds understandably would. He, like Sheasel, is happy to have the poise to try and get it to the better option if he can hold the ball that long. He kind of reminds me of a Lockie, a young Lockie Neal, sort of a smaller inside mid who hunts the footy. I think he's actually got better athletic tools than Lockie Neal. Obviously, Lockie Neal uh, is a Brownlow medalist and an absolute gun of the game, but I think there's some similarity, and I think that George Wardlaw might have that potential. In terms of his best performances this year, that came against GWS. He had 22 touches and nine tackles. He's had six or seven clearances three times this year, and he had another game where he had nine tackles. So statistically, he's putting up some pretty solid numbers. I'm going to go out on the limb and say this guy has the potential to be the best inside mid in the competition one day. And finally, uh, I'm going to show some love to a West Coast Eagle because I'm a biased Eagles fan. Um, and, you know, it's been a very negative year in terms of narratives for us. But one player that has surprised me this year has been Jaden Hunt. And I think he has proven himself to be quite an underrated recruit. So last trade period or free agency period when the Eagles signed him, uh, there was a lot of skepticism and myself included. I wondered why we'd signed a, uh, a guy that was going to turn 28 this year in a team that is clearly going to be re rebuilding for the longer term. But I think with the performances and the consistency and, you know, to be honest, the durability that he's shown this year, it's turned out to be a great move. When you compare his stats in his last year at Melbourne to now, he's pretty much doubled every stat. He's playing a bit more of an aggressive role. And I think what I've liked about him is that he has the breakaway speed, the tenacity to play on a wing, but also goes back and plays as a solid defender as well. His game against the Dons this year, where he had 34 touches and something like 700 meters gained, has to be one of the best games he's ever played at AFL level. And I've backflipped on this recruitment. I think we've done a great job there. It's one of the rare wins from this season. Sure, you know, in terms of demographics, it doesn't make sense. He's not going to be, you know, pushing to be in a side that's going to be competing for a premiership in six or seven years. But when you consider all the adversity the Eagles have had this year, the lack of availability for a mature talent, I think we could do with another bloody Jaden Hunt in this year's trade period. So there you have it, guys. That was me kind of just spewing my thoughts over the last three or four weeks of the football that I've missed. Like I said, everything will go back to normal now. I'm sure there's heaps of stuff that I've missed uh, in this particular video that's happened, but those are the, some of the things that stood out to me, so I thought I would share them. As always, guys, I really appreciate your support on this channel. Again, thank you for your patience after I took a, a couple of weeks off right in the middle of the season, but I'm here for the foreseeable future here. There's, there's going to be some trips coming up a little bit, but uh, they won't disrupt too much. They're just short and sweet ones. So I'm genuinely excited to be talking about football again. I am super excited to see Sydney and West Coast tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. Believe it or not, I am excited to see it. It's been a few weeks since I've watched an Eagles game live. So it's good to be back. I appreciate your support on the channel, and I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.